size of the group and the nature of the group is definitely an influencing factor to decision-making processes. Smaller groups tend to have more awareness of and, you know, have a sense of how decisions are made. And I find with so many groups, they're, they're not even conscious about their own decision-making processes. So large open networks where people don't have that kind of meaning-making to, to, to narrow down, they make def decisions by voting with their feet. They stick around or they leave. It's not, it's not generally done unless there is a structure that somebody brings in, which is, you know, here's the brainstorming period, here's the sorting period, here's the prioritization, here's the, you know, fi fixing um, option to, to, as to fitness for problem and stuff like that. Um, you know, they, I don't like this, I'm leaving, or I really like this, I'm in. Um, so, but when you get the smaller groups, then I think there have been groups that are do, do a really good job at decision-making it because they have an awareness and intention of the importance of decision-making. So it kind of goes to that adage, if you have bad habits, if you try and amplify your bad habits online, they become really bad habits. But if you have good habits, then you can think about how technology can enhance those habits. So I think that's what you're trying to do at Lumio. And it's going to make a whole lot more sense for groups who have awareness of their decision-making processes versus, huh, decisions? I'll do what I want. Um, in open networks, it defaults to the core group who has a stronger voice. And whether this is good or bad, you be the judge. I think it varies by context. So, for example, right now, um, the Knowledge Management for Development Group, cam is going through some soul-searching to try and understand what it wants to do around its own governance going forward. And nobody has really been clear about what constitutes a decision. On the core group, interestingly enough, silence means assent because it's a voluntary group and people have, like, they're off on field work, so there's never really the full attention of everybody, or rarely. So, you know, you have to move to a real adaptive pattern. But as, as the core group is asking the larger group what they want, it is not explicit how that decision will be made. And if the other group sees the community as a service, they'll go with whatever the decision makers say and they'll, you know, come or go. But if they see it as their community, that sense of ownership, all of a sudden the decision making process becomes more important. And I think this is something that's now surfacing in the conversation. Um, yeah, I'm writing a blog post right now about kind of three lenses of governance for, for a community. One is, you know, from the community of practice perspective, how do we learn? One is from the domain perspective, and the other is from, you know, how does this knowledge management stuff actually contribute to international development to improving people's lives? So you've got three sort of different lenses or even three scales, and your decision is going to differ depending on which lens you're taking, or is there a way to reconcile across those lenses in a large, diverse community. So I think it's tricky in large groups. In small groups, once people have had their awareness of how decisions are made, they tend to be pretty clever about figuring out how technology can support them. And they do a pretty good job. It's like when you see a really good virtual team, one of the patterns I see is short, iterative, you know, kind of small conversations about where they're going. So when they get to the decision-making point, they have a lot of context disconnected groups, they have to make sure that contact is present when they go to the decision because a long time between conversations, you can lose the context and then you start making a decision based on what I think I remembered we talked about, which can be, can, when you get my age, can be difficult because you forget everything. <laughs> a couple of things. One is that awareness, that kind of stream of communication, the light communication that happens through tools like, you know, open chat channels or Twitter or, you know, the Facebook page or whatever it is, whatever you're using, so that you have a sense of each other and what each other is thinking over time. And when you have, and Lisa Kimball, who's one of the early thinkers around online interaction, calls this line of sight. And that ability to have some awareness I think ups people's confidence level to, to make, to act, to make those little small decisions and just keep things moving forward. So that distributes, with a line of sight, it distributes the ability for people to make their own decisions in the moment, knowing that it has some cumulative value across the group. So that line of sight is the first thing. The second thing is, what are the fundamental agreements that we have? 
what are the things we want to accomplish? And then really encourage, empower, and empower and reinforce to people that you do it the way you want to do it as long as we get there. So that sort of, you know, compass, not a map um, direction. And clarity on when it's important to stop and include everybody and when it's important just to keep moving. It's even less about delegation than saying, here's what is formal and must be delegated, and here's what you just do. Um, and I think we, we can learn a lot from like paired programming in the development world um, or using agile methods like Kanban boards where we can make our work visible, we can make the interdependencies visible, and we just keep moving. And we, I think there's another piece that I two pieces from the, the Kanban perspective that I think is really useful, and that's K-A-N-B-A-N. -A -N. Um, one is you limit the work in progress. So if there's a million things a community wants to do, what are we focusing on now? Not everything. And you know there's a constraint that enables many people to be engaged. If there's too many things and we all think, oh, who's doing, you know, the, the whole coordinational aspect becomes very difficult. The other thing is to celebrate and mark what is complete or done or learned. So in a, in a Kanban on, on the far left side, you have all the possible things that could be working on. In the middle, you have your work in progress, what you are working on. And on the far side, you have what's done. And what's done is as important as what is being done. Because that is the awareness that we're actually making a difference. And when we're distributed, it's easy to lose sight. It's that line of sight again. It's easy to lose sight of what we are and have accomplished. And, you know, unless you have really great view and a great sense of confidence, you could lose confidence in a distributed network or community or team if you didn't see that you were making progress. So that making progress thing is also a real important thing.